Happy Tuesday and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnston directed feature, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And happy to welcome back another airplane nerd from the same place, Alden Frouchy. Alden, thanks for coming back for another episode. Of course. It's nonstop here as we're going to go sneak into the, uh, under the big fish fountain. <laughs> right. Uh, as, uh, as poor Cliff has to basically keep his phony baloney job at the, uh, as a waiter and, yes. and not, not arouse the suspicions yes. of uh, Master, Master uh, uh, Thespian Neville Sinclair. Right. And he's doing a miserable job of it, too, I have to say. Yes. Yeah, of course, right. you know, Jenny is just digging at him. Right there, Neville's asking, you know, so where is he now, this uh, this cliff? And, you know, he's probably hatching some harebrained scheme. I was surprised to learn that the uh, the term harebrained dates back to the 1540s. Yeah. And I'm, I'm always fascinated when you dig into etymology of something like this, wondering how accurately can we really pinpoint the origin of something like this, if it's just a oh, sort of a workaday expression or a common term. But presumably that might have been the first time we saw it in writing. But it goes back at least at least that far, and it's uh, it's exactly what you think. It uh, refers to a hare, as a rabbit, as being sort of flighty and skittish, and sort of all over the place. Yeah, well, so, all your good all your good rodent based adjectives are that way, like <laughs> you know, squirrely, for example. You right, think about that. Yeah. Just, squirrely, yeah. calling yeah. somebody a rat. <laughs> Rodents and language, what a thing! I, my <laughs> one of my favorite bits. Uh, there, there's a couple of favorite bits in this in this particular minute, but one of my favorite little bits of business is watching. Uh, Cliff tried to act nonchalant by carefully rearranging the flowers on this tiny little <laughs> right. table. <Yeah. laughs> it's like the baby's breath needs to be just a little bit to the left. <laughs> exactly. And he, he makes no he makes no improvements whatsoever. It was always sorry, it was always my fa- sister and I's favorite when we were kids. Um that was the part that would just have us rolling on the floor. And it's not a slapsticky bit, but there's just something about the way he's yeah, right. fluffing flowers that just puts you on the floor every time. Well, Jim, like you said yesterday, this is this has a hint of a little bit of uh, you know, the sort of the screwball comedies of the era. Yeah, you you can see uh, Billy Wilder pushing something like this. It just Right. It, it's it's very it's very familiar. And and to the era, 1938, I mean that was, you know, right. you could see Jimmy Stewart playing <laughs> playing exactly. this guy and trying not to be Although you know, if this were a true screw, uh, screwball comedy, you'd have uh, uh, you'd have Tiny Ron and the other guy, the 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 big gopher scene. You'd have those two guys show up at least four more times. Yeah, and in areas where it made no <laughs> sense, like suddenly they'd be in the background of the South Seas Club, dressed just like they are in their overalls, but having dinner, and then just saying, you know, that waiter doesn't know what he's doing, <laughs> and, and we'd see them again and again and again. It was such a trope that you would have. Whoever your comic relief was, you would just plug yeah, him in Ma, wherever you needed a laugh. Ma and Pa Kettle would show up. Yeah, just wanted, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, you know, very quickly, we, we mentioned yesterday's episode, uh, um, before we get too far into this minute, I was uh, sort of going sort of frame by frame and zooming and everything else. I think I got a little bit better look at that uh, airplane charm on Jenny's uh, on Jenny's bracelet. And uh, so I can, I can tell you that it is a, a high wing... Uh, it's a tail dragger monoplane. It's very stylized, so it's not an especially accurate representation of any sort of particular uh, real world type. Although, if anything, it reminded me of a little bit of the Spirit of St. Louis, so it could have been uh, sort of a Lindbergh, uh, Lindbergh trinket. Uh, it also, like I said, it's very flat, very stylized, but it could easily be inspired by the Lockheed Vega, just like Patsy's little uh, pressed metal airplane we've talked about uh, back in the Bulldog Cafe in the uh, in the earlier soup incident. Air- airline uh, or aircraft uh, decoration, jewelry and things like that were a popular thing in the 30s. I mean, a- a- aviation and air travel was considered romantic and was extremely popular with the general public. Oh, absolutely. And this is also uh, the beginning of the era of, uh, well, really, we saw a little bit of this in World War One, but the, certainly in, in the U.S., the 30s are when we saw the introduction of sweetheart jewelry. So you'd be in the Army Air Corps and things, and when you soloed, you could go to the PX and buy yourself a uh, or buy a tiny, like scaled down version of your wings, and uh, send that to your best girl back home. I actually built up a, a small collection of those that uh, I've given to my wife over the years. Um, so you know, U.S. and British, and you managed to find one much, much earlier, but the equivalent uh, of uh, German pilots' wings from World War One uh, on a little uh, on a little 
stick pin sort of thing. But yeah, very much a tradition. So giving his girl, here's the oranges for you, but but really the airplane's the cool part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much in that same tradition. And it didn't seem to work too well because she just seems seething in this the, the close ups when she's just her teeth look like they're just trying to, you know, <laughs> get on each get on the they're trying to pass right. each other. Exactly. <laughs> ah, just the, the you, know, you can see this, like almost neck muscles showing up. And un- you know, for poor Jennifer Connolly, this is of course one of the best views of her sty that appeared in her <laughs> right eye. So you can kind of watch the progression of that that thing. It's incredible. And this is just, it looks like her worst day. I mean, she must have been. And we're in minute 67 as Sty Watch continues with Jim O'Kane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to get out my ruler and uh, caliper and just find out exactly what the width is. But yeah, this is this is it at its worth. And I'm sure she probably woke up that morning. Oh, please, not now. Not here. Exactly. I have to act with James Bond for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> So. But they all, he, he took it all in, in hand pretty yeah. well. So, you know, apropos of uh, of next to nothing, other than uh, wanting to hear more from our uh, guest who's being so generous with his time, Alden, I've heard of a of, a, of an interesting little uh, sort of neo-noir film called The Crimson Spectre. I wonder if you would tell us uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so it, um, my senior capstone project, we work on, you start working on, um, actually the semester before you're going to graduate, you start kind of crafting the story and getting all your ducks in a row so that come that semester, you can spend a lot of time really filming it. So you get almost a semester of pre-production and then a semester for the production and post-production work. Uh, and so we did a, a short film called The Crimson Spectre, which focuses on a brother and sister, the Crimson Spectre, Jesse, and then her brother, Elijah, uh, who work together as villains of a sort. She's more anarchist than anything else um, and doesn't want, you know, she's not the Joker where she wants to run something or uh, any of the others who want to run or, you know, steal lots of things, whatever. She does it simply because she gets a joy out of lighting things on fire and blowing things up. <laughs> and who um, among us does not? And, yeah. And who, yeah, who among us doesn't? But because she doesn't really have any ambitions, her brother's getting a little frustrated and everything kind of comes to a head after, a uh, mission that was supposed to end with them robbing from a bank to keep paying for you know more explosives and whatnot and instead of robbing the bank she blows the bank up ah so he's a little frustrated and they get into it as only siblings can get into something (laughs) Um, and it was it's more dealing uh it while it's set in a comic book universe um Mm. that we created we have notebook upon notebook of backstory for other characters that you get like one second references to that maybe someday we'll go back and we'll go revisit those characters um it was more about the familial aspect of it and exploring family drama and relationships (laughs) in a very different way than you would normally think to explore it's probably worth pointing out alden that uh you have a sister Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> was there any, uh, not to go too personal, was there any inspiration there? <laughs> um, a little bit. And you know, a lot of the, the silly squabbles you have as little kid siblings, you know, one of them, somebody gets a better present, if you will, than somebody else did during Christmas. Like when Jenny got the GB um, and you got a pair of socks. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. you know, something like that. You, know, you get the iPod and she wanted an iPod too. And you know, so those, <laughs> the, the, the silly ones that as adults you look back on and just laugh at it now, but kind of exploring that like, well, what happens if it is... It is more serious to you and what you do. Stylistically, we went for, yeah, kind of that neo-noir, almost Gotham look right. in how we wanted to approach how it looked. Is this something that, uh, is it available online or streaming somewhere? Is there something we can, uh, our, our listeners can watch? Uh, not yet. We do have a uh, Facebook page. It's in the process. We're just finishing out the edits on okay. it now. And then once it's completed, we had a few re-edits we had to do uh it'll start making the festival circuit but i can definitely make sure people have the link to the facebook page so they can keep you know they can keep an eye on what it's doing in festivals yeah. and then at some point probably we're thinking late this year early next year it'll go uh live online uh, that's excellent wow. yeah for right now uh I, jim i'm sure we can get the link in alden's bio but uh, it's facebook.com slash the crimson specter so, yeah, it's pretty easy. And uh, just out of uh, out of curiosity, if somebody were watching, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody's watching TV and watching the weather in the Green Bay area, uh, is that still where we would see uh, your sister? Yep, yeah. Uh, she's WBAY Channel 2, I think. But yeah, no, WBAY. Uh, she does the meteorology for Excellent. me. Excellent. And while we're while we're uh, going down the list of your family, I do have to give a shout out to your dad, HG. He and I, uh, he and I have been friends for quite a while. 
uh, one of the first friends I made when I moved uh, moved out here uh, when he was head of the uh, Vintage Aircraft Association. So that's certainly a wonderfully strong common interest we have. And uh, I know he's uh, as big a Rocketeer fan as any of us as well, and would love to oh, yeah. hoping to get him on the show. And and you know maybe at some point you you both get on together or something like that. But for right now, you get to rub it in that you've done two episodes. <laughs> and, uh, I did it first. And you call your yeah, sister. Exactly. Yeah. I don't see you on any yeah. podcast, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. so. That's always been kind of the fun because we, originally I wasn't uh, a film person. I was actually going to school for air traffic control and then decided to do film. And my parents both love that they have one kid who does live broadcasting and the other one who's absolutely terrified of live <laughs> broadcasting and would rather craft narrative productions over months and months. Then you'll see it when it's done yeah <laughs> don't want it spilling into people's houses right out of the tv <laughs> there is i will say for specter and a lot of my projects there is just a hint of racketeer in just about everything i do and the genre in, in general that's still even when you're dealing with darkness to keep it kind of light and kind of fun because that's kind of how at least to me that's kind of how life is that you know even when it's trying to knock you down there's still some comedy somewhere to be found in it even if it's dark comedy we I wrote a script that we're working on now that's um, kind of the same time frame crimson skies for those of you original xbox fans out there and there are two lines that i stole straight out of rocketeer as a little <laughs> tip of the hat homage to it and, and speaking of crimson uh, skies uh skies trivia i worked on that game for about two weeks when uh, when some of their team was uh, was being reshuffled. I, I sort of slid over at Microsoft onto the Crimson team and another good friend of mine worked on it uh, worked on it quite a bit. So that was a, a fun title to have a hand in. But anyway, well, we're, 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 still, we're still at the... I, 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 don't know how, I don't know how to segue, but we're still back at... Uh, <laughs> we're all about the awkward the, segues, so... It's, it's okay. But here we are, smoothly yeah. smoothly yeah. transitioning back to... Uh, Speaking of giant uh, fish... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're watching, you know, he's trying to hurry things along. Clifford is trying to get things moving. So get, to get things moving, he picks up a glass and just pours champagne into Jenny's lap. <laughs> <laughs> how, to, how to get Jenny's attention here. Have some have some bubbly. Whatever works, right? I do like her poise, though, as she's explaining, would you excuse me? I have champagne in my right. lap. <laughs> just well, gonna... and it's amazing, too, because uh, she is... Uh, y- your poise is just the right word for it because she's addressing him by her his first name. Will you excuse me, Neville? And suddenly she has, uh, she's got a much, much stronger role in this relationship with Sinclair than she did when she walked into the place. And it's funny that, it, you yeah, know, it takes yeah. something sort of humiliating to get it there. But now she's mad. She's got to go deal with this. And okay, Mr. Movie Star, you know, you can, you can <laughs> sit and wait there for a moment when... I go deal with this thing, and you know she almost doesn't even bat an eye. No, it's it's stunning, and you, you got to remember at the time Jen, Jennifer Connelly is nineteen years old, and she can pull off this poise and and just you know it's great acting. She just such, just such a great job being very mature about the whole thing, and she's giving as good as she gets with Timothy Dalton. You know Timothy Dalton's been in this racket for decades. Just a, a stunning a, a stunning ability there that uh, it's really wonderful yeah. to watch. Yeah, like we said, when she's when we start this scene, she's she's holding her own. I mean, she certainly doesn't look out of place in the South Seas Club. She's as elegant as anything in there. She's a bit starstruck, and then by the time we get here, she's just she's just got this. This is uh, not a traditional. And she doesn't know anything about any distress yet, but this is not a traditional damsel in distress. Yeah, she's uh, it, it it is amazing, and I do I love watching her marching down the stairs. You know, we go from it's still kind of a stressful situation because there's there's all this kind of things happening but we're still in that screwball comedy where she she comes down the stairs and she's whipping off those gigantic uh beyond elbow length gloves and she's she's pulling it you know <laughs> it's so hard to get off when you get the champagne glued to your glued to your arm but she's she's coming down pulls them off and she's looking around for you know meet me by the big fish and she gets to that big cement or whatever that is uh some kind of uh poured fish <laughs> and gets yanked from behind as, as, as though she were you know had a, had a piano wire wrapped right. around her just, whoosh, just zips back into the ferns and then of course cliff stands up and hits his head immediately he hits uh, his head on those fountains which uh as a uh as a New Jersey boy, I, th- these things always remind me of. Uh, well, every, everybody else knows them as the band, but I know it as the as the wholesale outlet of Fountains of Wayne. There used to be a uh, uh, the, the now defunct Wayne Wayne, New Jersey was the name of the, the name of the town. It's very close to a very large shopping center, and just as you're on the road there, which I think is Route 46, uh, 
you'd go by this gigantic cement Santa Claus. And next to him was this big sign that said Fountains of Wayne. And as many, if you ever, if you've ever watched The Sopranos and you notice how many people in, uh, in northern New Jersey have their entire lawn pretty much replaced by cement figurines. <laughs> this is this is very reminiscent of what the show, uh, not the showroom, but the show yard of Fountains of Wayne was like. You saw pictures, you saw large cement porpoises and, and seahorses and and so um, it, it, uh, St. Francis and all kinds of it, stuff. It sounds to me like those are to New Jersey what uh, big fake plastic deer are to Wisconsin. <laughs> and, yes. and Alder, are you a Wisconsin native, Alton? Alden? For all intents and purposes, yes. I was born in Connecticut, okay. but we moved here, and I was like nine That's months right. I knew old. You, so I knew your family had much. some roots in Connecticut, but uh, anyway, that was uh, that was one of the uh, sort of the quirky culture shift things for me is uh, just the staggering number of big fake deer in people's yards, and it's not it's, it's not <laughs> a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with it, and then, you know they're often very sort of tastefully arranged with a bit of feng shui if that's a, if that's if you can have that outdoors with plastic deer but uh it was uh, it's just not something i was used to seeing so oh, my my wife used to live in the town of lemonster massachusetts and what lemonster was known for was it had a large plastics factory and they supplied about 99 percent of the world's uh production of pink uh plastic flamingos oh. they went out of business about uh i'd say five to ten years ago, but uh, the entire town was coated in, <laughs> in pink flamingos, and they, they distributed to the world. That was their the primary export of, of Lemonster. It is it is just amazing how you can tell where you are just from what, what's on people's right. front lawns. Ah, but we, we, watch, uh, we watch Dear Jenny uh, getting yanked underneath the... Uh, <laughs> A, a great thing to edit against as they they both pop into the frame with... Uh, <laughs> I just I can wa- I'm, I'm scrubbing yeah, so back, back and forth, forth and watching just... Clifford bang his head on the <laughs> on the underside of 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 the fountain there. Some perfect banter that goes from screwball to uh, to pathos. He he has to explain to her that Bigelow's been murdered, right. and it 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 all just she her face goes from anger to absolute you know uh, concern and wonderment that she just yeah. And this this moment as soon as uh, as soon as Cliff says murdered, we just we flip a switch and. You know, for this instant, the uh, the screwball comedy piece is behind us. Although there's a, there's a bit of sort of not quite slapstick stuff coming up, but uh, a bit of lighter yeah. things there. But another great uh, another great turning point. Jenny is now taking this uh, this particular harebrained scheme a little bit more seriously. She knows the stakes are high, and and suddenly, finally, she believes uh, she believes Cliff because that's always yeah, they could have played up. Uh, and I'm so glad they didn't. They could have played up this frustration where Cliff is doing this thing and Jenny doesn't get it or doesn't believe him. Or whatever else you could have played that out a lot longer and made that so much more frustrating i think they just they hit the tone just right it's like she doesn't really know what's going on but boom now she's taking it seriously she's going to see him in action fairly soon no spoilers and it's all gonna you know really sort of click into place for her that uh, there is something serious going on and the, the narrative strategy in the script at this point you even though you know she's She's been thrashing him. It's the it's the Dave Stevens style in the comic books that he you know like like at the time it was Betty in the in the right. comics, but she'll just get mad at him for for something. But deep down, she's you know she's madly in love with Cliff and vice versa. She takes him seriously when the times require, it, and she's actually listening to him, trying to figure out whether he is having a harebrained scheme or not. She's evaluating the whole time he's talking to her. You're watching her acting with her eyes, examining him. You know how true is the things he's saying, uh, and and also how does it affect them? What well, what's going on? It, this is another one of those scenes where I mean, it's not only the script, it's the cinematography because the the camera just loves Jennifer Connelly in that in this scene, the lighting and. The, you know, it just it just lights up her whole face and, and her concern and stuff like that. It really the, the interplay between the way the camera is capturing her image and the, the emotions that she's portraying on the screen is just a fantastic combo. I, I love the the sound in the scene. The, the whole movie. I'm I'm a sound guy. Sound design is what I like to do. Uh, it's what I tend to do in in my editing world. I like when Cliff stands up. The satisfying thud of his head hitting that big fish hurts yes. your head watching. <laughs> it, it really does. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you feel that. And you you feel for Billy Campbell. You're like I want to know how many times you had to do that in the size of like the goose egg on the top of his head by the end of all of those takes of standing up into that that piece but even uh, you're it, when you're I was watching it getting ready and I'm listening and you can hear softly the people walking behind them but it's kind of muffled by all the plants and you can hear the music off in the right. distance I want to go back and rewatch it a couple more times and really listen to it because it almost sounds to me like as as it goes makes that transition from slapstick screwball comedy to 
serious moment of Bigelow's been murdered, everything kind of seems to fade out. And it gets a little more quiet in the scene right up until they come back out of the plants. And then all of a sudden you remember, oh, wait, that's right. We're in this beautiful South Seas club. Uh, it's just it's fantastic. Yeah, I, w- I would love to see like a track listing because it's got to oh, be yeah. about, you know, 10, 12 tracks thick at oh, least. No kidding. Uh, yeah. All the all the ambience going on in the background, the ambient sound is is amazing. That makes that that makes that whole set seem bigger than it is and busier than it is. And of course, the uh, uh, you know that music in the background, uh, is, you had pointed out in your summary, Jim. That's night and day. So another Cole Porter classic. Uh, again, arranged by Billy May. Oh, sure. Uh, and uh, from 1932, I think. I think Fred Astaire was the first one to sort of sing it. Uh, in uh, original or eventually became known as the gay Divor- uh, divorcee, but uh, I think there was a slight name change for that uh, that musical at the beginning. Yeah, and probably one of I mean I think if you ask people name a Cole Porter song, that might be the one that a lot of people would come up with uh, quickly. Uh, no, Jim, you're wrong. It's "Begin the Begin" sung by uh, Melora Hardin. I believe we've established this. <laughs> yes, that uh, that is definitive Cole Porter. Well, I guess and, it depends uh, who you ask. Yeah. But yeah, if the... you disagree with me again, sir, I shall challenge you to meet me by the big fish, and we will. Settle this like men. Yes. Oh, bring soup. <laughs> yes, bring uh, soup. <laughs> the terrible thing about this movie is is that there's hardly anything to criticize, and it makes it difficult because this is just such a beautiful <laughs> scene. And, and Alden, like you pointed out, the sound is so deep. Everything, it, they pay so much attention to the small details, and getting it wrong wouldn't have made it much worse, but this makes it so much better. It just, right. it really, you, you feel like but, you're, you feel like you're, you're hunkered down behind a big fish fountain. What, uh, and Alden, you made a great point. So I'm scribing back and forth and, you know, just letting it play very, very quietly. But I think you're absolutely right that uh, we bring that ambient noise down a bit to emphasize the intimacy and the drama of and the tone change that we've been talking about, that Bigelow's been murdered. And such a subtle thing. I, we feel it, but I, I don't think I would have ever, ever noticed it unless I was specifically trying to think from the strictly from the sound perspective. Yeah, yeah and I, you know, since sound designer i I, it was what i one of the things i was looking for both in my i rewatched the whole movie but also this (laughs) just just to make sure yeah (laughs) i bought a new tv so i was like oh i gotta break it in somehow (laughs) you know this seems like a really good idea but you know even the little things like the button press when he when the the rocket gets activated each time but especially the first time and then when he salutes in front of the or off to the side of the tri-motor and goes plummeting thousands and thousands of feet down (laughs) it's just you know there's a very distinct noise that it has and little things like that dropping the audio when you're in in a very uh really an important scene it kind of it's setting you up to kick off the third act of the movie of uh, everything's kind of coming to a head we start realizing how important this rocket pack is to people that they're willing to kill a man who has nothing to do with this rocket pack to get to the guy who has the rocket pack because he's he's the one you want oh taking the girlfriend out on a date and it all just kind of comes to a head and then the sound just kind of amplifies how important this one seemingly innocuous event is there's a, one little bit of punctuation in this minute when Jenny is you know going down to the foot of the stairs and she gets yanked into the into the alcove behind the, the <laughs> fountain. She's not moving her, her mouth, but they drop in a little gasp from Jenny where she gets pulled in. And it's it, what you're used to in a cartoon of having just some little noise when something happens. And her gasp is right at that point. So it, it again, the, the sound is, is what makes it makes it a little bit right. better, a little bit of seasoning on it. And if this were uh, if this were a true screwball comedy of the era there'd be a 50 50 uh, chance we'd hear a penny whistle as she was uh, you know, <laughs> just whisked back in there uh into the ferns we've got to stop watching Tim. the movie while we're watching yeah exactly <laughs> like, just hey remember this that. part guys i like this part <laughs> shut up i'm watching yeah, another thing we'll put on our list of uh, of things to ask uh, ask billy next time he joins us is you know also you're pointing out how many takes did he have to go through hitting his head on there uh, of course with you know with sound design being what it is we get that that wonderful thunk you pointed out but this thing could be styrofoam you know or it could be you know, yeah, made yeah. out of pillows and but we hear the thunk and, and it sells us you know i wonder was that uh, was that intentional was that written in did it happen once and uh and joe said no i like it let's go with it just give me 20 <laughs> more takes until you're, you're until you're unconscious but uh yeah. If you see two Jennies, we'll stop. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Big fish swimming around his yeah. head. <laughs> right. Chirping like little birds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stars. Uh, one, one of the things that we we brought up with uh, Melora Hardin and with Billy Campbell is that this entire South Seas thing was filmed in a day. They did one day on this set. 
that and that they filmed so many setups and I mean, they must have been going from dawn till well, the next day, probably. It's just incredible how many, I mean, the setups, the, the camera setups on this one alone, there's, you know, you just watch, she she gets yanked into the thing. They do the stand-up with a two-shot where the two of them are arguing with each other. Then they do the shot over Jenny's shoulder. Then they do the reverse shot over Cliff's shoulder, and they cut back and forth to those. So it, that's at least, that's four camera setups right there. And they got it all done in a day. And I just, and you just think about the coordination with uh, the band, with yeah. you know, the band leader and and all of Melora's choreography, just the extras, everybody sitting at tables, everybody, it would have taken a, a day just for wardrobe, you would think, <laughs> just get everybody all dolled up like this. Yeah, just have, well, the, it's, the, it's obviously a sign of a good production staff. They really, <laughs> yeah, really are the pros. Kidding. That just, that blows my mind. You yeah. know, you participate in some of the video shoots we do at work and then, you know, some of the promo things and... You know, it takes two hours to set up for a, a you know a thirty second shot, which is which is half the length of the whole video. <laughs> I, I feel like we're doing a good job when we get the the guests to show up. This is great, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> like, like, like you all, and thank you very much for uh, for, yeah. for getting up early on a day off to to get this done. Oh, yeah. I know you guys right now as this is being aired, you probably are deep in the uh, half a million of your best friends uh, out there with, uh, <laughs> with with airplanes and things getting all this this particular show underway is i appreciate the time that uh, that you take to to do this while while so much is coming up I mean, this is like watching the oncoming tsunami and you say well could you fit in another couple of you know half hours <laughs> <laughs> to do some shows so it it is much or like stopping for a bowl of soup uh, just to yes. keep the recurring yeah. theme <laughs> so, you know, yes. disaster we're, we're is pending flowers. but uh I could use some <laughs> tomato bisque. <laughs> wow, but it's uh, all that. It's been it's been great uh, uh, having you on the show. I'm sure we're going to have you on again uh, to talk some more airplanes and, and movies. Uh, it's it is a great and it's always great to talk to people who love this movie. And there are oh, yeah. there are many, and I think the number is growing. Thank hopefully thanks to our podcast. I converted a couple of them while I was in school uh, of people who either had never even heard of the movie. Uh, one of my friends uh, who. Hal also knows Connor, oh, sure. who is very well may be listening to this episode while he's working on GB models as he well. He better be. <laughs> oh, not, there will, there yeah, will right? be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I will drive to Manitowoc and go give him what for. Hang <laughs> one on his over to my house. down there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting him waltz without yes. it. Uh, <laughs> he came over to my house one night, and yeah, he and I, we watched The Rocketeer because I talked about it incessantly, and he was like, all right, I got to watch this movie. I like airplanes. Like, what is this? And he's, yeah, there are posters on in his bedroom now. <laughs> That's fantastic. That, thanks to the easy availability of eBay, it's just yeah. it's terrifying what this movie does, especially from the merchandising angles. Uh, but it my is poor wallet. It, it is it is fun. I mean, you this is a movie that you can recommend to anyone and say, "Look, you're going to like this movie." I have yet to find somebody that said it was okay. But I've never like, unless you look at the, the the movie review reviewers of the time, all of whom were dumb. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. In our esteemed and professional opinion, you guys were dumb. It lasts and lasts. I mean, it's been going for quarter of a century now and it finds a new generation of, of viewers or people in the same generation who just hadn't seen it the first go around i i i like watching people watch this movie because they it for lack of a better term it's such a movie movie you really get uh your suspension of disbelief just gets hung up on the wall and <laughs> uh, it, it's uh it's such a beautiful thing and uh, well I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here yes, exactly <laughs> tell me more about this rocketeer jim yes that <laughs> sounds wonderful like- yeah, it's it's not too bad as a as a film, and it, you know it beats watching uh, the the school lunch menu on the cable channel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the very first movie my my girlfriend and I ever watched together, our first official date, if you will, was The Rocketeer, because I was like, you need to watch this movie, and so much of me is going to make so much more sense <laughs> right. to you. And she fell in love instantly with Jenny. She uh, th- she thanks God that I have all of the the magazines and memorabilia and whatnot she keeps making noise that she wants to take all the measurements and just like work out how to make jenny's dress to <laughs> so she has jenny's dress to wear around well, well you we know, know a guy. <laughs> we know we know a guy we know Hello, a guy. mike bruno <laughs> hope you're listening my friend um oh, gosh he's uh yeah he could maybe snap an extra picture or two you never you never know um and congratulations to your girlfriend for uh for passing the test because of course, yeah. if she, you know, if yeah, uh, she she watched the movie and you watched her, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Studying her face, is that a frown? Hmm. She better like this. Yes. Oh, did she not like that yeah. scene? Well, and Alden had his clipboard out, making you know yeah. checks and What's different wrong columns. With you? Yeah. He says, I'm sorry. I'm afraid that uh, it's it's you or the movie, and well, <laughs> but. Uh, 
Anyway, it is a it is a great uh, sort of a glass slipper in that sense, and and good for you for uh, that uh, that it fit. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, well, yeah. Although we will definitely have you back on before before the, the credits roll. We'll, we'll ha- oh, have yes. you on again. But th- thank you very much for being part of this. For folks who want to join in our conversation, as always, we are out there on the social medias. We can you can find us on the you can find us out there on the Twitter at uh, Rocketeer Minute. You can find us on Facebook at Rocketeer or Facebook dot com slash Rocketeer Minute. You can find us on the big site Rocketeer Minute dot com. Pick up on all the previous episodes. Pick up some cool swag so you can uh, have. Uh, <laughs> have your room dressed up in posters and such that Amazon will be happy to sell you. Uh, we, we, we've got that in our store section. And you can also uh, check check out on previous episodes here. Uh, please subscribe to us, iTunes or Google Play. Leave us a great review because that always helps us. And it makes Hal very happy in the morning when he's you know sitting with his bowl of cornflakes going, oh, look, we got another review. So... <laughs> It's, I'm extremely vain and obsessed with attention, so, tell, so please. Tell us more about how you like Hal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes. And Jim's not so bad either. Uh, but really, Jim, it's our guests, our guests yes, who bring it, in the good true. reviews. We, we got the A-list guest. It's it's great. People who know this movie, who love this movie, can be on this show. I, I don't want to hear from any naysayers, so don't even bother asking. <laughs> but we are going to have uh, tomorrow, hopefully... I, I think it's, at least it's on the schedule on my it, and spreadsheets never lie it looks like we're going to have the rocketeer himself on tomorrow to talk more about one good reason why jenny should believe any of this but we'll we'll, we'll talk some more with uh with uh, billy uh, all the thanks again and uh we'll see the rest of you here tomorrow on the rocketeer minute so until next time over and out